I am right now in LA and on the first round I am facing the one and only Dina Belenkaya. She's sitting next to me right now. Dina, how are you feeling for a match? I'm excited to take you down once and for all and I'm excited to show the world what is cow opening. Dina, do you really think you can beat me? Are you 100% sure about this? I think I can beat you 10-0 with my eyes closed. <laughs> Oh, I am so excited to prove you wrong. <laughs> okay, our games are just about to start. How much have you prepared for this game? Uh, about two weeks. Two weeks. And you've prepared more against me than anyone else? Yes. Why do you want to beat me so much? Mm, because I want to prove the world that uh, the cow opening is not a real opening. So you think I'm going to play the cow opening? Mm, I, th I think if you had balls to create a shit like that, then I need to sh <laughs> give you a lesson in chess. <laughs> okay, sounds good, Tina. <laughs> My game is about to start and I am so excited. I'm sitting right here by the board and I can't wait to beat Dina. She really thinks she's going to beat me, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna play my very best. The game against Dina is finished and we have a result. So this was an absolutely insane roller coaster game. Like I have no words to describe this game, but I am so excited to show it to you because this game had everything. It had tears, it had smiles, it had laughs, it had tears again. Um, it, it had a lot of different things, so <laughs> I'm going to show you the game. This is my one classical game versus woman grandmaster Dina Bilenkaya. Now Dina's had a peak rating of well above 2300 in comparison to me. I've had a peak rating of like 2175. So she is by far a much higher rated person than I am in chess, but I was really excited to play this game against her because I thought that she would underestimate me. She kept going on all morning about the fact that she was going to beat me, that she was going to beat me in 30 moves, and she kept saying that it would be so easy, and I really just wanted to go in there and prove to her that it was not going to be as easy as she thought, and well, here we are. So, let me show you the game. All right, so I had the white pieces, and I started with the move 1d4, of course. Now, she played knight f6, I won c4, and this became a queen's gambit declined. I was very much expecting her to play this, so there was no surprise here. So I took on d5, and then I played bishop g5, and Dina told me that she had prepared against me for two weeks, which I'm not sure I believe, because she didn't really play anything new. She played the line that she typically plays, and my mom had actually shown this to me. So I had a little bit of preparation from my mom, Grandmaster Pia Kramling, and I actually expected Dina to play this. So here I played bishop g3. I was kind of thinking, you know, what happens if I would take here because there's this crazy line of knight takes d5, c takes d5, queen takes c8. But then I ended up realizing that after knight c6, queen takes rook and knight, um, well, I wasn't really sure exactly what she could do. I saw that there were a few queen before checks, but I also thought that after knight f6, my queen is actually trapped here. So I didn't really like this, plus I knew that my mom had told me that I should play bishop g3 in this position. So I went bishop here, Dina pulled up her knight, now she's trying to get this square for the knight, a very beautiful square, and I just simply moved out with my knight. So far I was feeling really good, and I was, we were both playing pretty fast. And it was at some point here that Dina also appeared with a pineapple shirt, I think. Like, she went and then came back to the game wearing a pineapple shirt, and I wasn't really sure what was going on. Um, but anyway, so f4, rook c8, and now I play this move knight a4, and this is actually kind of a mistake because I'm giving Dina control over this square. Now, I, in this position, I should have done something like f5 and forced her bishop to go back, and then after this, I can maybe get in my rooks and just play normal chess. But Instead, I moved my knight to a4, trying to get my knight up to c5, but the problem here was that after she moves up her knight to the center, and I go knight c5, she has this beautiful move bishop f5, and now I don't really have f5 anymore, she has been able to activate her bishop, everything is a lot better for her than what it was before. Like, if she would have taken something like here, this would be very different, this would then be actually really good for me, because this move would not be possible as I would take the pawn. So here I realized that I had made a mistake and I was really unhappy about the fact that I had made a mistake. And so I thought, okay, let me move back with my bishop. But here, like, I am doing much worse. Like, this mistake literally made my position be so bad. 
So I moved back my bishop, and then she took my knight. And here, if I take this knight, then she's going to go bishop takes uh, bishop, and then she's going to play knight e4, and there is nobody in this universe that can get rid of this knight. This is the greatest knight on earth. So I thought, okay, I cannot really do this. So I took on f5, the idea being that after takes and takes, yes, this knight would come up here again, but at least now my queen is slightly more active. And here, I played a move that I thought was crazy, but it's actually the top engine move. So the computer thinks this is the best move, and that made me very happy. So I moved up my rook to f3. And you might say, Anna, why are you doing this? Well, the reason I did this was because I wanted to play rook h3, and then I wanted to play knight g4, and then I wanted to sacrifice my knight and then take on h6. It was a very creative plan, and I was like, there's no way the engine actually likes this, but it wasn't actually that bad. So she played c5 here, and this was a mistake for her because now she's weakening this d5 pawn, and she completely missed that I had this move knight d7 threatening her rook. And here she actually spent like 20 minutes thinking, which I wasn't really exactly sure why, because I thought she had to play rook e8, but there's actually some sort of, you know, knight d6 in between move that she could try to do to get my queen to move back to h3. So she went rook e8, and I was considering here several different moves. At first, I thought I was going to play queen takes d5, but I didn't like it after knight f6, takes, takes, trading queens, and then something like, well, I was thinking about d takes c5 in this position, but I just thought that her rooks would become quite active, but this was probably just wrong, and this is probably what I should have entered to get an equal position. However, here, I took on c5, and this was a big mistake, apparently, um, which I didn't really understand, and neither did d9, I think. <laughs> this was quite a complicated position. I played b4. We both had three minutes on the clock here. Here, I'm supposed to play rook d1 and simply threaten this pawn, but I played the move b4, threatening the bishop. She went bishop d6, and now went rook d1, and both me and Dina had no understanding that this was completely winning for her, apparently. She played rook e6, and now, you know, the chaos unfolded. This was a roller coaster. I played knight e5, threatening to take on f7. She took on e5, which now gave me quite a nice position, opening up for my rook and my queen. I'm threatening on f7. She went rook c7 here because she wanted to both defend on f7 and defend this pawn as if she goes something like queen e7, I can take here. And now this was the blunder of the game, or the first blunder of the game, to put it that way, because she completely gave me a free piece now. My mom was freaking out at this point, because now I just won a completely free piece, queen takes knight. And here, I am completely winning. This is the easiest game I could ever win. Like, this is just me being a piece up. My pieces are working beautifully. And everything that I need to do is just finish the game. I mean, I'm completely winning. I would win this 9 out of 10, 9, 9.9 .9 out of 10 games. <laughs> um, so I was trying to just centralize my pieces and have all my pieces be kind of happy together. Um, then I started kind of playing for the checkmate. Played e6 here. I was trying to weaken her king. And this was just completely, completely winning for me. Queen c8. I played bishop e7, threatening rook f8. She played queen h7. And here, you know, I can do a lot of different things. I can go queen check and then just you know, trade queens and be an endgame, a piece up. I can do an absolute million different things. Probably easiest is just for me to go bishop c5 and then go queen g6 and then just go um, rook f8 and win the queen. However, in this position, I made the worst possible move that someone can possibly make, and that is that I blundered a piece. I played rook g4, I had, you know, just a few seconds on the clock. I had 20 seconds on the clock when I made this move, and this move just completely loses the advantage as I miss that she has rook takes e7. And now I cannot take this back because then she picks up my rook. And she doesn't only pick up my rook, she also, um, it also becomes a, um, it also becomes a checkmate. So here the best thing I have is to trade queens and take this pawn. But at this, and this is a completely draw. But at this point, after I blundered my piece, I got very tilted and I still try to play for the checkmate because in my mind, I still wanted to win the game. So I played rook f1, rook c1, she started trading. I wasn't really sure exactly what to do. I blundered my pawn 
and then I played queen d6. Here she played queen e6, and now I entered an endgame being a pawn down, and I could not possibly understand how I had done such a big mistake. I kept on shaking my head. I kept on just asking myself, how could this possibly have happened? I just, I couldn't believe it. So I went check here. Um, I spent like 20 minutes on this move, but it wasn't really because of me thinking about what to do. It was because I was just so upset. This check is completely useless. I should just take here and then go rook f7. But I must take her queen because if I do something random like queen b8 check and I start picking up some pawns, she is just going to win the game. I mean, the queen is coming in, my king is so weak, this pawn is so good, I have to trade queens. So I ended up checking, we traded queens, and then I entered this endgame where I quickly realized that for me to draw this game, I need to get rid of her A and B pawns and I need to have her only having the D pawn as her extra pawn because it's the pawn that is closest to my king and my king will have an easy time defending this pawn from promoting at the same time as defending the G and H pawns. This I realized pretty quickly, so I realized that I had to go for the A and B pawn. So I threatened her D pawn with the idea that if she goes rook B5, this rook would be stuck and after something like king F2, I thought this would be an easy draw. Instead, she played rook a6, threatening my pawn. I picked up her b pawn. Then I went back to d7 to threaten both this pawn and this one. And then I ended up trading off these a and b pawns. So we entered this endgame where at first I wasn't really sure exactly how it was. But I quickly realized that I just need to stop her king from entering the position. And how do I do that? I do that by simply always attacking this g pawn. So king e3. I started kind of re-maneuvering my, my king, and here the only move that saves the draw is this check, forcing the king to make a decision of where to go, but if now the king goes to f5, I can go king f3, and this king cannot enter, and if she ever goes rook d3, I go king f2, and now if this king enters, well then I will be basically taking this pawn. However, I was kind of scared that she would play something like g5, and I wasn't really exactly sure what was going on here, but this would just simply be a draw as well. Um, so we started kind of remaneuvering. She didn't really know exactly what to do, and I was just kind of going back and forth with my king because she only has four squares to go with her rook. So I always just had to make sure that I didn't lose the g-pawn, and then I was just moving with my king at the same time as I was defending my g-pawn. So finally, I was able to go king e4, threatening this pawn, and now in this position, I made sure to go king f4 as if king f3, there is rook e3. So I just make sure to go back and forth, defending everything. And here, after 77 moves and five hours of playing chess, me and Dina drew the game. Now you may say, Anna, drawing is great because, you know, she's 200 points higher rated than you and she was so sure that, you know, she was going to beat me. But I was just so upset that I blundered a piece in that way, like 9.9 9 .9 times out of 10, I would win that game. Like you give me that position in a one minute game and I would win it. And it's just so frustrating that I made such a terrible blunder in such a winning position. I had a really hard time coming, you know, coming through with that. But the truth is with Chess that she blundered, I blundered, it happens. And a game of Chess is not finished until the game is actually finished. So I learned the lesson from it, and I also learned the lesson to never think that a game is over until it is, and always play your best. So that was my game against Dina Belenkaya, my one classical game of chess against her. We drew, I'm pretty happy with the result, and more than anything, I'm just gonna try to play as well as possible this tournament, in case I didn't tell you now that I'm realizing I'm in Los Angeles, playing the Botas Chess Camp, or the Botas Chess Invitational with seven other very prominent chess players and, and chess streamers, female chess players and streamers. So wish me luck for round number two. And uh, yeah, I'll be making a video of it if I win. I'm kidding. Or am I? OK, see you. <laughs>